Well, hey, welcome to church. Are you guys having a good day? Awesome, awesome. Well, welcome to church. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I'm excited to be preaching God's word to you today in lieu of Pastor Josh being on sabbatical. And I just want to be encouraging everybody in here to be praying for Pastor Josh as he's resting right now and getting recharged and ministered to by the Holy Spirit and other people that he'd come back locked and loaded, ready to preach God's word for us in here. And so, uh, so excited to preach and so excited about all the things that are happening here at E. Evangel and excited about the MLC program that we just talked about. And for those of you who don't know, that MLC is actually very close to my heart. It is uh, actually my uh, beginning into ministry. When I got saved about seven years ago, I felt a call into ministry, and so I signed up for the MLC program. And I got to learn how to preach. I remember my first sermon. Oh, man, my first sermon, I'll tell you what, I would love to share it with you, but I would be too embarrassed to do that. But <laughs> lots of change since from then to now. But uh, got to learn how to lead a connect group, got to learn how to pray for people and just do ministry on the everyday life. And then after MLC, I went to Bible college and I started interning at a different church there called Cedar Valley. And in the spirit of internship and celebrating MLC and highlighting it, I thought I would share my biggest fail as an intern, my epic fail. Do you guys want to hear that? Okay, so I was interning at Cedar Valley uh, in the youth department. And as I said, I was going to Bible college. And uh, in the cities, because there's so many Bible colleges and there's these churches, you have a lot of interns at a lot of different churches. And so there's a little bit of a competitive nature, right? You want to stand out. You want to be the intern that looks, you know, like the gold that everybody wants to hire. And so me and my friend David were interning at Cedar Valley. And we were tasked with this uh, a task to shoot the video announcements. And so we decided we we're going to take this to a whole nother level. And uh, we were going to do the video announcements like Fox News level quality. And so we went out, and we called it Paradigm News. That's what the name of the ministry was Paradigm. But anyway, so we went out and we found this awesome videographer. He was a professional. He did it at such a high level uh, of quality. And then we went out and we found the perfect uh, anchor man. He had this chocolate audible voice, right? He was perfect for it. So we had the right equipment. We had the right person, and now we needed the right venue where we were going to shoot these video announcements. And so we decided, why don't we do it like ESPN, like how they set up like a desk, like on grass in front of a building. And so we're like, oh, that's a great idea. So we went out, and we grabbed the information center of the church. It was like $1,000. It weighed like 1,000 pounds too, right? And we decided we were going to load this to the back of the church trailer and drive it to the Mall of America and set it up on a piece of grass and shoot the video announcements. Great plan, doesn't seem complicated. So we get this information center, we put it in the back of the trailer and we start driving to the Mall of America. Now if you've ever been to the Mall of America, you know there's like some ramps that you go up. And uh, so we get there, we start driving up the ramp to go park the van and all of a sudden we hear this loud thud and this creaking sound. And I look at David and I go, what was that? So we hop out of the vehicle. And we look and we see the height indicator sign that's like 8 feet. It's like 15 feet up in the air because the trailer was too tall, right? And so it's about to bust and I look at David and I'm like, oh no, this thing's about to break. And so we start panicking. What did we do? People are behind us honking at us and you know all that pressure when you're in the vehicle and all that stuff. And so I was like, all right. We're just going to have to keep driving through this. And so we pushed on through. And uh, afraid this thing was going to snap. It doesn't snap. It slams the back of the trailer. And you guys know, like, when you make a mistake while driving and how everybody drives past you and, like, looks at you. And what do you do? You go, <laughs> you just stare straight, right? <laughs> you don't look to the side. That's what I was doing right there. So anyway, we get to the spot this plot of land where we're going to put this information center out. And we hop out of the vehicle and we go to the back of the trailer. When all of a sudden, mall security shows up. I look at David and I said, David, we got to split. So we take off running, right? <laughs> we're running. We're neck to neck. And all of a sudden, David goes down. He's tasered. He's shaking there like this, right? His foam's coming out of his mouth. And I look at it and I just pause and I just keep running, right? Choppers are all around me. A spotlight hits me, right? Just kidding. That didn't happen. <laughs> So there we were at the trailer, going to unload the information center. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to laugh at this joke. <laughs> anyway, we're about to unload it, and uh, we open it up, click, click, click. 
and we noticed that we made a dire mistake. That loud thud that was earlier, that was the information center. We didn't strap it down inside of the trailer. And so we look at the trailer, there's holes all over, there's dents inside this trailer, and the information center itself is broken. And so I'm panicking, like, what do I do? This thing is like $1,000. And I look at Dave and I said, all right, we're just going to have to keep pushing forward. So we take it out, we set it up, we lean the wood up against it and try to make it look as pretty as possible and we shoot these announcement videos. And the quality was good, but it just looked really bad because of it. And so we load it back up and realizing, oh, no, we have to go back through the height indicator, go back through all this stuff. And on the way back to the church, I just kept thinking, what am I going to tell Pastor Micah that what I did? And we get there, we go and sit down with Pastor Micah. He looks us right in the eye. And he says, so, what would you learn? And I said, David did it. <laughs> Just kidding, I didn't do that. But hey, all to say, sign up for MLC if you feel the call of God on your life. <laughs> Just don't break the information center. <laughs> hey, we're kicking off, or we're continuing on with our series called Man on a Mission. And we've been traveling through the book of Luke, looking at the life of Jesus. And Jesus is on a mission. And his mission is to inaugurate something called the kingdom of God. And uh, what the kingdom of God is, it's, it's the sphere of God's influence throughout the world. In this kingdom, Jesus is the king. And all of us who are Christians, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. We are a part of the people of God. And so chapters 1 through 9 in the book of Luke, Jesus has been the sole person doing the kingdom work of ministry. And his disciples were hanging out with him and learning how to do this. So he was healing the sick. He was casting out demons, raising the dead, teaching the Sermon on the Mount, doing all these things. And the disciples were being students, watching him do this. And then today's passage, though, is the very first time the disciples are sent out to go and do the ministry themselves. And so today we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 9 verses 1 through 11. Luke chapter 9 is 1 through 11. If you want to use the Bible in front of you, it's on page 841. Here's what it says. It says, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority uh, to cast out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. The reason he said that is because it was a short-term trip they were going on. They didn't need a lot of equipment with them. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had been raised from the dead or had appeared and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus everything they'd done. Then he took them with him and they, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. So the title of my sermon today is this, From Boys to Men. And so we have a story here of the 12 disciples, the very first time they get their shot of doing ministry themselves. So Jesus has been teaching them, he's been training them, and now he's unleashing them to do the kingdom work themselves. Now, all of us in here, we're followers of Jesus. We're disciples of Jesus Christ. And just like how the disciples had to go through this process, all of us in here, God wants us to go through this uh, sort of rite of passage. And there's qualities that these, these disciples developed in this story that I believe that God wants all of us to do as well for the kingdom of God. Now, the first thing that I think he wants us to do is this. He wants us to all to be proclaimers of the kingdom. Verse 2 says this, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. Now we don't know where they went exactly. We don't know who they talked to. We don't even know what they said 100%. But what we do know is that they went village to village proclaiming the kingdom of God. Now I imagine as the disciples went out, they began to teach the things that Jesus taught. 
They probably began to echo the things that he said up to chapter 9. He probably went up to people and said, hey, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Or the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, we're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to do good to those who do bad to us. And they began to teach people the kingdom of God the way that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. You know, that word, proclaim, can be a little intimidating at some times. Now, in Greek, it's kariso. It means to make a public declaration. And the disciples were proclaiming the kingdom of God. And it can seem intimidating because when we think of the word proclaim, you might think of the word preach. And you might be in here and go, I can't do that. I can't do what Pastor Nate's doing on the stage. I don't know the things that Pastor Nate knows. And I'm intimidated of standing in front of large crowds. And I don't want to stand up in front of a restaurant and start doing this. And I want to encourage you with something. That you don't have to do things the way that I do things. That God has gifted each of us in a unique way to proclaim his kingdom in our own ways. So, and I want you to know that I can't do what you can do. I can't reach the people that you can reach. And it's not about, if, what, about what you know. It's about what you do with what you know. A few years ago on my birthday, a couple of my friends took me out uh, to this Thai restaurant. I never had Thai in my life, and I was like, guys, I really do not want to go to Thai. And they forced me anyway. So I went there, had a horrible experience. I did not, I did not like Thai food the last, like, five years of my life. And, uh, but recently, another friend of mine took me to a different restaurant in town. And it changed my perspective on Thai food forever. And that restaurant is Eat Thai. Anybody ever been there? Right? <laughs> Eat Thai is amazing, and I love their Pad Thai, level zero, you know, no spice. I'm a redhead. I can't take any heat. Uh, <laughs> but ever since I've ate at Eat Thai, I tell people all the time, you got to eat at Eat Thai. It's so good. Now, here's the thing. I don't know exactly why it's good. I don't know what ingredients they put in there. I don't know how they cook it. All I know is that when it goes in my mouth, it tastes really good. And the same thing it is with Jesus. You say, you might not know how it all works, even why it all works, or what exactly all the intricates of the gospel. But what you've got to know is that it does work, that he's changed me, and that he is good news. And if I know just that, I can begin to proclaim the kingdom of God. And you can proclaim God's kingdom in a variety of different ways. Now, behind me right now, there should be a picture that shows up. This is a picture, there's a lady in our church, her name's Shannon Warenga. And she makes this art on a regular basis. If you've ever been baptized here, this is a gift that we give to people that get baptized. She gifts this to everybody in our church. And every time she gifts this to people, what she's doing is she's proclaiming the kingdom of God. This is Jesus being baptized. But she does this with a lot of other art pieces. She makes art for a living and she sells them. And she, guess what, she's proclaiming the kingdom of God through her art. And you can proclaim God's kingdom in a variety of different ways. You can use videography, if you're a videographer, a photography. You can do it through blogging, through writing, maybe video blogging. You can use who you are and use it to proclaim God's kingdom. Social media. Maybe it's just sharing your story. And I think this is something that we all can do very easily. Just say, hey, this is what my life was like prior to Jesus. I was struggling with this. Then I encountered Jesus. And this is what my life is like after Jesus. Or when you're at your workplace or when you're in your schools and when you're talking to somebody, students. You can say, hey, I understand. I've been through that myself. You want to know what helped me with that? Is when I actually prayed to Jesus. And Jesus helped me go, go through that situation. You can begin to share your story. Share the victories that you have in your life. And you are proclaiming the kingdom of God. And I just want to encourage everybody in here to use who you are. Whatever you do to proclaim God's kingdom. The second thing that I believe that Jesus wants us all to be is that he wants us to be vessels of healing. Verse 2 says this, heal the sick. And so God's kingdom is twofold. First off, it's spiritual, which is why we proclaim. But it's also physical, which is why we pray for healing. And the Jews in Jesus' time didn't understand this. They thought the kingdom of God was just going to be this physical thing that took over Rome. But Jesus didn't come to do that. Jesus came to defeat sin and its effect on his creation. And sickness is an effect of sin. It is a corruption of God's perfect creation. 
And so when Jesus came to the earth and when he began to inaugurate this thing called the kingdom of God, he began to reverse the curse of sin on creation. And if sin brought sickness and disease and death, Jesus brings life. And in his words, I bring it to the full. And so we as Christians believe that God can heal today. That Jesus is still healing people today. And so we pray for everyone to be healed. And the disciples, when they went out, they began to heal the sick is what the Bible says. And they probably thought of all the times that Jesus healed people. How he healed Peter's mother-in-law or how he healed the man with the withered hand or the man with leprosy. And they probably went up to people and prayed the similar things that Jesus said. And prayed, put their hands on them the way that Jesus would have said it. And all of us in here are called to be vessels of healing. To pray for people to be healed. You see, Jesus is like a sponge that absorbs all the things that are wrong in our life. You know, a sponge, you put it in water and it soaks it up. But when you gave your life to Jesus, he's like a sponge that soaked up all of our sin. And he paid for, died on the cross and it was left in the grave. But in the same way, he's like a sponge that soaks up our diseases, that soaks up our illnesses. And so when we pray for people, we're asking him to absorb the things that are wrong in their body. Here's what I've learned about praying for healing. It's simply this. When I pray for no one, no one gets healed. But when I pray for everyone, sometimes people are healed. And sometimes healing comes in the form of supernatural, where someone's just healed of a disease. Their leg snaps back in place. And other times, healing comes in the form of practitioners of healing. Perhaps you're in here today. You're a doctor, you're a nurse, or you're somebody that's in the medical field. I believe that God has gifted you with a mind that understands the human body better. That you understand anatomy and the physiological things of, of the human body. And I think that God has graced you with that. But he wants to take what you're good at and make you even better at that. He wants to give you power and authority to do that even better. Imagine if you were talking to somebody in your office and you're trying to diagnose them with something that's happening in their life. And you're not 100% sure what's going on. But in the back of your head, you said, come Holy Spirit, speak to me about what's going on. And boom, you get the answer. Boom, now you know how to actually give them the right prescriptions to treat their ailments. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He doesn't just want to operate here on a Sunday morning. He wants to operate in our everyday life while we're out being people and doing the kingdom work every single day. You know, every other Tuesday I have a connect group at my house. And my neighbors come to our connect group. And one of my neighbors is suffering from cancer right now. She has two young kids and she has a cancer that if it's not fully healed in the next 10 to 15 years, she could potentially pass away. And so every week we pray for her. There has not been one connect group that we have not prayed for her to be healed of the cancer. And she's been going through practitioners of healing. And what has happened is that she's been going through some radiation. And the doctors believe that the radiation has killed the tumors. And so she could be healed. We'll know in three months. But until then, we're going to keep praying that she is healed. And even if that didn't heal her, guess what we're going to do? We're going to keep praying that God heals her. Because if we pray for no one, no one gets healed. But when we pray for everyone, sometimes people get healed. Another friend of ours, they've been suffering from infertility the last two years. They came over to our house a couple months ago and they were telling us how they've been struggling with this and how they want to have kids. And they said that they're feeling very discouraged. And so we decided we would encourage them, but also that we would pray for them. And so we put hands on them and we prayed that God would open their womb. And guess what? This last week, they sent us a text. We've been praying ever since. And they took a pregnancy test yesterday, or this last week, and it was positive. And right away they were like, oh, is this... Did God really do this? Are we really pregnant now? And so they took a test the next day. They took two tests. And guess what? Both of them were positive. And they still were questioning it. So they took another six of them ten times. And every time they were positive, they went to the doctors. They took blood tests. And her numbers were off the chart. And she's pregnant. <laughs> when I pray for no one, no one gets healed. But when I pray for everyone, sometimes God heals people. And she's pregnant. And here's why I wanted you to know that story. Because that happened this week. God is still healing today. And if he can do it for them, why can't he do it for you? 
Why can't he do it for your coworker? Why can't he do it in your family? Why can't he do it out in our community? If we pray for no one, no one gets healed. When we pray for everyone, sometimes God heals people. Amen? And so we're all called to be vessels of healing. The next thing that we're all called to be is this. Fighters of evil. Verse 1 says he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons. And so this passage, Jesus tells his disciples to cast out demons. And people were demonically possessed. And listen, demonic possession is something that still happens today. It's not a common thing that you see in our area of the world. But there are other areas of the world where demonic possession actually happens on a regular basis. Okay, A lot of times with the practice of the occult. And so the disciples went out and they began to pray for people that were demonically possessed. And they probably were thinking the same thing. Oh, I remember when Jesus cast that demon out in Capernaum. Or I remember when he went up to the, to the man Legion. And he cast all the demons out of Legion into the herd of pigs. And they probably took authority just like Jesus did in those moments. And prayed the same other things that Jesus prayed. And guess what? Demons were being casted out. Now listen. Again, that's not a common thing that you're going to see around here. But what is common in our world is evil. Evil is all over. And it takes a variety of different forms. Sex trafficking, child abuse, drugs, violence, war. These are things that are evil in the world. And the Bible teaches us that there's principalities behind all of this. Or demonic influence that influences the evil in the world. But Jesus has given the church the power and authority to stand up to the evil in the world. And that's why it's so important that we feed the hungry. It's why it's so important that we provide medicine for people who are sick. When we rescue people who are in sex trafficking. When we stand in the gap for those who don't have a voice. When we help children that are being abused. Because we're doing the kingdom work. We're doing the things that Jesus Christ himself did. Jesus healed people. He stood up for people that didn't have a voice. And Christians and people that are part of the kingdom of God are supposed to follow in the footsteps of the king. And the king, that's how he lived his life. And so this is why Legacy Makers matters. Because there are people that are on the field that are fighting evil all over the world. And when we give our money to Legacy Makers, we support them so that they can keep doing that in Jesus' name. See, Romans 12, 21 says this. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's when we do the good things in Jesus' name that we can show people what the rule of God's kingdom should look like. And all of us in here can do this. And perhaps you're in here today and you're a firefighter or maybe you're a police officer or maybe you work at a nonprofit organization. Just like how God wants to fill doctors and nurses and medical people with power and authority to do their job, he also wants to do that for you. Police officers, you hold the evil at bay. Firefighters, you fight the natural evils of this world. Nonprofit organizations, you're the one who's sending people out, being strategic on how to do that. Imagine if, if you were sitting in a meeting, like, where should we go? And God, the Holy Spirit just speaks to you, like, this is the location. Or if you're fighting a fire, you're inside a house, it's burning. And all of a sudden, you get a thought in the back of your head, go into that room. You go into that room and somebody's there. God wants to work this way every day, not just in the church building. He wants to use you to be fighters of evil. And so what we need is the power and authority to do that on a regular basis. And so I want to encourage you to be a person that fights evil. To be a person that stands up to the bullies of this world. And when there's evil, you do good in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. The next thing that I believe that Jesus wants us to be is reputation makers. Verse 7 through 9 says this. And he, being Herod, was perplexed. Because, because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah appeared. And still others that one of the prophets so long ago had come back to life. And if you keep reading it, it says, and he tried to see him. And so as the disciples went out and began to proclaim God's kingdom. They, as they were praying for healing, casting out demons, doing good in the name of Jesus. The news about Jesus began to spread everywhere. And Herod, if you know him, he wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He didn't want to listen to him. But guess what? He was perplexed by him. Because that's what the power of God does. It perplexes the Herods of this world. It perplexes those people that don't want to listen about Jesus. 
Because the reality is, is that you have somebody here who's addicted to drugs, that their life is falling apart. But all of a sudden, their life is back together. They have a family. Things are going good for them. What happened? What was the thing? Jesus is what what happened. And it begins to perplex people. You know what? You got people that are struggling with a certain sin and all of a sudden they're set free from it. What happened? Jesus happened. You have somebody who's struggling with infertility. They can't get pregnant. All of a sudden they have babies. What happened? Jesus healed them. Right? And that's the power of God at work. And the Herods of this world and the people that don't want to talk about Jesus. It's so easy to argue philosophy and argue theology and argue all the lofty arguments of the world. But it's so hard to deny evidential life change. When someone's life was this and it's no longer this. And this is why it says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk but of power. And when we live our lives on purpose for God's kingdom. And when we begin to do the things that Jesus did, lives are changed and it's hard to argue that. That someone's life is different. And so I want to encourage you to be a person that builds the reputation of Jesus. Make him famous in your everyday life. And sometimes people have a hard time accepting Jesus for he claimed to be. And then there are times when people are just going to flat out reject you and not want to listen to a single thing you say. Which brings me to the next thing that we're all called to be. And that's this. Kickers of dust. Verse 5 says this. If people don't welcome you, this is Jesus, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So when Jesus told his disciples to kick the dust off their feet, it had cultural implications. Okay, Jews, as they went to Gentile cities, would do that anytime they would reject Judaism. But Jesus told his disciples to do this to the Jews. And so he went out to the Jews, and they went out to the Jews, and they began to talk about God's kingdom. And there were times they said, nope, we want nothing to do with it. And what they were to do was to kick the dust off their shoes. And simply, this is what that means. I did all that I could, now it's up to God. Another way of saying that, maybe in modern day language, is I wash my hands of this. And it wasn't in a sassy way, like, I want nothing to do with you. It was a, still out of love, but there comes this moment where, guess what? You can't force someone to love Jesus. And when they reject, reject Jesus, you can't take it personal either. Don't take it as a rejection of you. You know, being rejected is not fun in my opinion. Unless you really like that stuff and you're weird, you know. <laughs> but listen, there's going to be moments when you talk about Jesus to people. And they're going to be unreceptive. They're not going to want to hear it. Don't take it personal. Kick the dust off your shoes. There's going to be moments when you ask someone if you could pray for them. And they're going to be unresponsive. Nope, don't want that. Don't take it personal. Just kick the dust off your shoes. It's going to be moments when you want to do good things for people. And they're going to be unappreciative. Don't take it personal. Kick the dust off your shoes. I'm always reminded of those moments where Jesus said, hey, when the world hates you, remember this, that it hated me first. And the reality is, is that people have an issue with Jesus. It's not you. And so kick the dust off your shoes. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it ruin your day. We're not responsible for how people respond to Jesus. We're only responsible to deliver Jesus to them. And leave it, leave it at that. So be a person that kicks the dust off your shoes when you're rejected. Which brings me to the next thing that I think we're all called to be. And that is receivers of ministry. Verse 10 says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. And I love this image of the disciples returning from their missions trip, their reach trip. They go and they report everything they did and saw to Jesus. And then it says he took care of them. And I want you to know something. That Jesus wants to be a part of your everyday life. He wants to hear the things that you're doing. He wants to be a part of the results that you're having. And that's why as Christians we pray. And we praise because there's moments where, guess what, we go and we go to work and we share Jesus with somebody and sometimes they reject us and we go, Jesus, I had a hard time today. I, I, I obeyed you, I did what you told me to do and someone rejected me. And in those moments he wants to take care of you. But then there's moments where you go and pray for somebody and they're healed. And that's when you go, Jesus, thank you so much for showing up in those moments. And you praise him for those things. But listen. He, doesn't, he wants to take care of you. He wants to, he wants to tend after you. You know, the disciples, 
They come back, and here's, the, here's just the reality. You can't just go, 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 give, 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 give. That's not what I'm trying to say today. But you have to have a rhythm of your life where you go and do ministry, and then you retract. You go and pray for people, and then you get ministered to yourself. And that's why you have to show up to church so Pastor Josh can pastor you guys, and he can preach God's word to you, and he can minister to you. And then you go out and you do ministry throughout the week and you come back. And this is why it's so important to be in a connect group so that you can have people that are ministering to you. And then you go out and be a Christian out every single day. And so you got to have that rhythm of going and coming back. And Jesus did this. He would do ministry. If you read the Gospels, he'd go heal people. He'd go preach, preach. And then it says he would withdraw and he would pray. And he'd have the Father minister to him. At times even angels would minister, it says in the Bible to him. And so he had this season and this rhythm of going and retracting. You know, in my life I do this, I have this set up. Every Saturday I have a second connect group that I have. And this group is a group of me and a bunch of friends where we just get together and we read the Bible. And we talk a lot of theology and we go really deep into it. And if you know me, I like that stuff. And so it fills me up. Some of you, might, that might stress you out. But that, to me, that fills me up. I'm a nerd, okay. <laughs> And so I love doing that. I call it sausage and coffee. Uh, what do we do? We eat deer sausage and we drink coffee and we read the Bible. That's all it is. <laughs> but I love it and I look forward to it every single week. It's something I'm excited about. And I'm always filled up when all the guys leave. And I'm ready to go for the next week. And there's sometimes things that I even preach up here that I learned while I was in the group. And it's a rhythm that I have in my life. And all of us need to have that rhythm in our life of going and retracting because the reality is you cannot give that which you have not received. And if you want to be a person that's used by God, you also have to be ministered to on a regular basis. If not, you're, it's going to be like your love tank went empty, okay? Or your ministering tank is going to burn out. Which brings me to the final thing that I want to talk about. My second final thing <laughs> is that I think that God wants us all to be called and empowered. I'm going to invite the worship team to come out at this time. You know, at the beginning of the story, it says that he called his 12 disciples and he sends them out. But at the end of the story, it says that the apostles returned. They went from disciples to apostles. Something changed on the journey. Now, the word disciple means one who is a learner. It's a student. The word apostle means one who has been sent out. And I believe that's the journey that God wants all of us to go on in here. This moment of being a student to being one who has been sent out. You see, they left as disciples and they returned as apostles. They left as followers and they returned as leaders. They left as ordinary but returned doing extraordinary things. They left as boys but they returned as men. And that's the journey that Jesus wants us all to go on. From sitting in church rows and receiving things to being the hands and feet of Jesus every day in our workplaces, in our families, as we're out shopping at Dan's supermarket. He wants you to be a Christian at all moments of your life and to the ends of the earth. But there was a key ingredient to their success, and that was this. It says, when Jesus called them together, he gave them power and authority. They didn't go out until they had the power and authority to go and do that. Would you stand with me at this moment? This was the first time that Jesus sent his disciples out. But it definitely was not the last time. They went out a few other times as they were developing. But after Jesus died and rose again and right before he ascended into heaven, you can read the rest. Luke wrote the book of Acts 2. Acts 1.8, Jesus commissions them. He says, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to be gone forever, but I'm going to send someone else to help you. And this person, the Holy Spirit, is going to give you power and authority to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He says, don't go out doing all this stuff until you receive that. And the Holy Spirit wants to empower all of us in here today. And perhaps as I was teaching today, you were sitting there going, I want to be a proclaimer of God's kingdom. I want to be a person that prays for people and sees people get healed. I want to be a person that fights evil in this world. I want to be a person that makes Jesus famous, that operates off the power of God. I want to be a person 
that has thick skin, skin like a rhino, that can reject, that can let, the, let it roll off my shoulder. And what you need is the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. And it's so easy to receive the Holy Spirit. All you simply have to do is ask is what the book of Luke says in two chapters. We'll go over this in a couple of weeks. And so here's what I want us to do. I want all of us to open our hands right now like this. And we're going to say a simple prayer. And then I'm going to pray over you. And here's what this prayer is. It's one of the oldest prayers in the church. It's come Holy Spirit. So I'm going to, we're going to say come Holy Spirit together on three. Have a moment of silence and then I'm going to pray over you. And so let's say this together on three. One, two, three. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Father, I just ask right now that you would send the promise, that you would send the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come right now and that you would fill us with your power and with your authority. God, there are people in this room that want to be proclaimers of the kingdom. Holy Spirit, would you come right now and would you give us the power and authority to proclaim your kingdom. God, I pray that you give them gifts and insights on how you want them to do this. If they're musicians, I ask that they'd be better musicians. God, if they're artists, would they be better artists? If they're videographers, would they even become better at it? If they're storytellers, would they become better storytellers? Holy Spirit, we ask that you come right now and that you'd help us to be vessels of healing. Give us power and authority to heal, to heal diseases. To pray for people that are sick and that they would be healed. God, there are people in here right now that are sick, that need healing. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come, that you would touch their bodies and that you would heal them in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and make us fighters of evil. And we lift up all the evil in the world, the sex trafficking, the child abuse, the starvation. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would use us to be the difference. That you'd come and fill us to fight the evils of this world. So Holy Spirit, come, give us thick skin. Come and minister to us, those who are weary and heavy burden. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and just be the comforter. And that you would fill us today with your power to make Jesus famous. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's children said, amen, amen. Hey, we're going to go into a time of singing. And let's just praise God. And if you ask for the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that he will give him to you. We're so glad you joined us today. Our hope is that you're challenged and encouraged by these teachings every week. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry to change lives. Send us an email at mystory@goevangel.org. For more information about our church, check us out online at goevangel.org.